ones. All right, it looks like we are live. I'm gonna go ahead and change this to speaker view so that the Instagram world can hear us. And hi everybody, it's Anne with the doctor.com. I am here with Dr. Trevor Cates, our special guest. Dr. Tom will be on in a minute, but um, I'm gonna take this time to get us started and introduce uh, Dr. Cates here. So um, just so that I don't get anything wrong, I'm gonna go ahead and just read it right off the screen here. Uh, Dr. Trevor Cates is an author of the USA Today best-selling book, Clear Skin from Within and founder of the doctor. Okay, can you uh, hear me oh, now? Oh, here's Dr. Tom. Dr. Tom, can you hear Trevor, us? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I can't hear you. Why am I? Dr. Tom, or he can't hear me, so I'm just going to call him. No, it's okay. I, I had my computer on mute. And, you know, that little line <laughs> through there. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, right, perfect. Right. We are on live. Dr. Tom, you're up. Do your thing. <laughs> well, you know, it's just a good demonstration that people can be pretty good at something and real dunderheads on other stuff. So <laughs> my computer, the mute button up on top got hit somehow, and I didn't see that. Hello, hello. And um, you've already heard who Dr. Cates is. And uh, yes, did uh, Anne? I did one short sentence. So let's go ahead oh. and reintroduce her, Dr. Tom. Oh, OK, OK. Well, this is my friend, Dr. Trevor Cates. Hi, Trevor. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Zoom, zoom. Yeah, there's always something. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Cates and I have been friends for 10 years, maybe pretty close, so somewhere six, six, seven, eight. I don't remember uh, how many years it is, but it's been quite a while. And she is my go-to person when we're talking about female hormones, uh, balancing female hormones, and specifically their impact on the skin and how what, how do you think about this whole topic? Um, Dr. Cates has worked in a couple of really high end spas as the spa doctor in Park City, Utah, where there's wonderful resorts that people go to who can afford that kind of thing. And uh, uh, so she's been doing that for many years. And she wrote her first book was a USA Today bestseller. And uh, um, it was, uh, let's see, it was, well, I know the next uh, skin from within, clean skin from within, right? Clean skin from within. And uh, her new book is Natural Beauty Reset, the seven day program to harmonize hormones and restore radiance. Uh, and that book will be coming out in September, but we'll give you the link to, if you like, to pre order with Amazon. And uh, so uh, Anna put the link in there. So that's a little of the background. Uh, Dr. Trevor is my go-to person when you want to talk and learn more about what do I do for healthy skin. So it's just a pleasure to see you again. We have, um, uh, haven't been able to see each other in person in a couple of years because of COVID, but that's all starting to open up. Uh, once again, yes. which is great. Yes, it's so great to see you virtually. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yes, you too, you too. Um, it's, <laughs> I've got to do my thing, so bear with me for a minute, please. Hello, hello, it's 410 now Pacific, uh, 510 Central, uh, no, no, uh, Mountain Time, uh, 710 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 1210 a.m. Wednesday morning in Dublin, and also in London, uh, 1 10 a.m. Wednesday morning in Italy and the rest of Europe, uh, 8 40 and 9 40 a.m. Wednesday morning in Australia, uh, 11 40 a.m. in New Zealand, Wednesday morning, and it's Facebook Live. And I always do that because we have people from all over the world. And when they write in and say hello and um, they tell us where they're from. So tell us where you're from, folks. It uh, makes our day to really see how many people are here from all over the world. It's really great, really great. So let's start off. Let's just get down into the uh, nitty gritty of this. And what is it about our skin? Um, you know, if I think about veterinarians um, or horse ranchers, when they, or even dairy farmers, when they're looking at an animal, one of the things they look at is 
the teeth. You know, they'll go up and they'll look in the teeth and they're looking to see um, for indicators of how healthy this animal is. Now, for humans, we also can look at the skin. We're not supposed to have this tough hide, you know, or this wrinkled hide. Uh, so when you look at someone's skin, what are some of the things that it can tell you? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Tom. I, you know, our skin is our largest organ. It's right on the surface of our bodies. Wait, wait, so wait, 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 wait. We have to stop there. When you say it's our largest organ, that means that it must have a number of processes that it does. And um, so can, can you just tell us a little bit about why you say it's an organ? Yeah. So we have different organs of the body. And I think a lot of times people forget that the skin is an actual organ. It has microorganisms living on it. We have a whole skin microbiome that lives on our skin. We, um, our skin interacts with all different aspects of our body. We have an HPA access on our, in our skin. We have a lot going on in our skin. And I think a lot of times people just think it's this outer layering to protect all the other organs, but it has an important function. And because it's on the outside, it has a unique, we have a unique opportunity to have a picture on the outside of what's going on inside. So that's why I call skin our magic mirror, because it's just giving this outer reflection over our overall health. And yes, I think it's yes. really important because a lot of times skin is treated as something to just suppress issues, cover it up, suppress it. Right. Let's put some cream on it or, you know, yeah. let's uh, maybe use some oil or something. So I'd like to go back for a moment because I don't think people know this, that there's a microbiome to the skin. And they've heard me talk forever, probably ad nauseum for some people about all disease begins in the gut and how important it is to have a healthy microbiome in the gut. Can you just take a moment or two and talk about this microbiome of the skin and what, what is this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, naturopathic physicians like myself, I've been talking about, you know, gut health related to skin for a long time, but what's really exciting now is that the research is actually showing up more and more about the skin microbiome and this, the gut skin access, or the, even the gut brain skin access and this whole connection. And so we, you know, I'm sure you talk to your people. I know you talk to your people a lot about the gut microbiome, but people don't talk as much about the skin microbiome, right, but right. we have microbiota all all around in and around our bodies. It's not just the gut and we're learning more about these other areas. And so with our skin, it's one of the main things that keeps our skin healthy, keeps it from breaking out in acne and eczema and, um, you know, psoriasis, premature aging, even aging itself has to do with the skin microbiome. And it's really about keeping it healthy. So not all bugs are bad, right? So we, a lot of times people are using these soaps and cleansers, and especially with acne, stripping the skin, trying to get oils off the skin, and they're using all these things or, or hand sanitizers and all these things, antimicrobial agents to, to kill off bugs. But we need some of these bugs to help keep our skin in a healthy place. Can, can you still hear me, Dr. Trevor? I can. Okay. My, my camera just went off. I don't know why, but it stopped. And I can see the picture of me that looks like <laughs> that it froze on. Um, so we'll just continue for a moment and maybe Ann can send me a text of what I might do in the background for uh, to get the camera back. But um, let's see, let me just make sure, um, stop video. Okay, now let me go back and uh, start video. Oh, the light's on, but no, the light just went off. Okay. Mm -hmm. so. I'm, there we go. There we You're go. back. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Um, so this idea, I'd like to stay on the microbiome for a minute of the skin, because this is an area I don't think people are very aware of. How impactful is the um, our choice of soaps that we use, um, or well, shampoos are for the scalp, but soaps that we use on the skin, how does that impact on the microbiome? 
Yeah, it and it has does have a big impact. And so when when we're talking about the skin microbiome, what we do both externally and internally impacts the skin microbiome. So it is something we really want to pay attention to on both both places. So for for you talk specifically about soap. Well, our skin is really one of the biggest functions of the skin is to act as a barrier to the outside world. So it protects us from the environment. So it has mild acidity to it and it has certain microorganisms that live on and protect it. They're very different than the gut microbiota. And so when we use soaps, a lot of times what we're doing, first of all, bars of soaps or anything that's foamy typically means it has a high pH and that is damaging to the skin um, that, that mild acidity that helps protect it and keep the microbiome in its balanced place. So yeah. that's one of the things it immediately raises the pH of the skin, which is harmful to the skin microbiome. And then again, if they're using antimicrobial agents in there um, and, you know, antimicrobial soaps and things like that, it also can damage that those good bacteria that are living on the skin, trying to protect us. I mean, we have bacteria, we have viruses, fungi, we have even little mites that live on our skin. And these are actually there for a reason and to help us. But when they get just like the gut microbiome, when it gets out of balance, that's when we start to have more problems. And what we want to do is restore that balance so that our skin can clear up because our skin is constantly trying to make up for what we're doing on the outside, as well as what we're doing on the inside. So I'm, I'm in Seattle right now uh, in the middle of a speaking tour, and I had forgotten just how wonderful the air is here uh, around the trees. Uh, my friend lives in one of the suburbs, Bellevue, and there's just giant trees everywhere. And it's a little chilly. It's in the 50s, which for me, you know, I've got two shirts on and two pairs of socks. <laughs> you know, I've gotten warm blooded. But I'm noticing how good my body feels. Um, and it reminded me about forest bathing. And we know that forest bathing is great for your immune system. There's really good science how it increases the number of natural killer cells and the effectiveness of other components of your immune system to fight bacteria and viruses. Is there anything about the air or the environment you're in that has an impact on the health of the microbiome of the skin? Yeah, interestingly, it, it there's more research unfolding about this. But interestingly, when we spend time in nature, these microorganisms that live that are in nature, in the soil, in the air, when it rains and the soil um, releases these bacteria and spores and things from the from the soil it actually can impact our skin microbiome. I mean, it, skin microbiome is really fascinating because it's on the outside of the body. Basically, whatever we come in contact with can impact our skin microbiome. Who we live with, if we have pets in our home, the cleaning products that are used in a person's home, and and you know basically people's hygiene in the home, not even your just your own, but everybody else around you that comes in contact and is around you. You know, I was startled that I read a study that was probably four years ago now, maybe five, and they took 10 people and, well, first they, they took 10 hotel rooms, had the cleaning staff clean them, prepare for the next person coming in, however they normally clean them. And then, and they tested the microbiome of each cleaning room, the surface of the bed posts and the desk and the door handles. And they, and they got a baseline for each of the 10 rooms. Then they had people sleep in the room overnight and uh, get up in the morning, take a shower, get dressed and come down to breakfast. And then the team went in to each of the rooms and swiped the bed posts and swiped the handle of the doorknob, you know, the doorknob to the bathroom. They could tell which person was in which room by the bacteria that they were picking up that weren't in the room yesterday. And that the balance of those, and that just blew me away. It's like, what? So we have more than just our fingerprints or an eye scan. We also have a microbiome scan that's unique to us, completely unique to us. 
And it just startled the heck out of me that that happened. So when you talk about the people that you're with, you know, that you are uh, uh, close to, you know, your family members and all that affecting your skin microbiome, I believe that now. I understand. I don't know much about it, but I believe that's true. So we got a couple of questions. And the first thing I want to comment on is to say um, uh, thank you to Colleen uh, to tell me it's one o'clock uh, in the afternoon in the Hawaiian Islands. Aloha, Colleen. Thank you so much. I won't, I'll try my best not to forget that in the future. We, great to have people here from the, from the islands. That's really nice. And um, JD asks a really good question. Uh, but JD, we're, we're not on that part of the topic yet for today. So if you could put that and ask everybody to put their questions in the Q&A, if you could put it in there, copy and paste it over there, then we'll get to it when we're talking about uh, uh, balancing hormones, some of the techniques that can help with that. Okay. Um, and I just want to give a shout out to Quincy, my, my uh, fab fan in Iowa. Hey, Quincy, glad you're here. Thank you so much. Uh, and Quincy's family, they watch every week. Quincy is this not to be stopped young girl uh, who is going to change the world um, and make sure that her, she and her family are as healthy as possible. So way to go, Quincy. Really glad that you're here. Um, okay, so let's move forward now. And how does one begin to evaluate the status of their skin? Where, I mean, if people are interested in this, where do they start? You know, it, it would be really great if we could just swab the skin and get a whole bunch of analysis on that. And I thought maybe that would be coming soon, but it's been years. They've been trying to figure out how to labs have been figuring out how to do that. The problem with doing any kind of tests like that is that you're microbiome is so different all around the different areas of your skin. So like around your nose is very different than behind your ears or your neck or in the creases of your elbows or your feet is a very different or your armpits of course is a very different, um, microbiota living there. So it's not that easy to just to swipe and test. Um, what you can do though, is really pay attention to your gut health. And we, we do know there are lots of gut microbiome testing because when you have a healthy gut microbiome, microbiome, that's a really good indication. You're probably going to have a good skin microbiome. And so if you, if you work on your gut health, that is a crucial part of this. So we've talked about some of the things externally, but working on the gut microbiome is one of the biggest things you can do to help your skin microbiome. And we can do testing with, with the gut microbiome to find out what's out of balance there. And I certainly find with my patients with things like atopic dermatitis, eczema, or acne, which are really the most common skin conditions that we see is that there usually is some sort of gut dysbiosis. So we want to test for that, address that and get our bodies back in balance. So it starts there. And then meanwhile, using topical skincare products that help support the skin on the outside and being mindful of like those harsh cleaning products and also those clean, you know, bars of soaps and cleansers that strip the skin of that natural myelicidity and those natural oils that live on our skin. And so using skincare products, like that's one of the reasons why I created the spot doctor line is because it need to be in that mild acidity to help support the health of the skin to help give it that extra support it needs until it can really get into a healthy place. So if someone's trying to do a realistic evaluation of their skin, what are some of the things that, you know, people say, well, my skin's fine. Yeah. I got these little bumps on the back of my arms, but my, you know, yeah, that's normal. I've had that my whole life. What are some of the things to look for that say, you might just want to reevaluate what you think? about right. your skin. I know. And I think that there are a lot of myths out there about, oh, well, this sort of happens when you get older, or this is just sort of normal or other people in my family have this. So it's just, I've just been helped that, you know, dealt this um, hand of genes, genetic pool that I'm in. Um, and so, but as you know, we all know that um, you can actually change your genetic expression by the lifestyle choices that you make. I, as a child, I had really bad eczema, um, hives, a lot of atopic allergic types of skin issues 
issues and I was miserable. I was itchy all the time. And, and I had the family history. A lot of people in my family had that, but I found out and certainly I'm still looking at ways that I can, you know, support my skin both from the inside and outside. So certainly sometimes it's obvious with our skin. We get these kinds of itchy rashes and bumps and acne breakouts, eczema, anything that's an eruption, anything that shows up on the skin can be a sign that something's out of balance. And and don't let anyone tell you that, oh, it's just normal or just use this topical and it'll go away because yeah, it might go away for a little while, but your skin's trying to tell you something. So in, before you start suppressing it, which, you know, it may be part of your, um, your, you know, integrative medicine treatment, but look for the underlying cause. What is it trying to tell you? And so, and interesting, you mentioned those little bumps on the back of your arms. It's a very common thing and it's called keratosis pilaris, generally that's so those little bumps in the back of your arm, you can, some people get them on their cheeks or their thighs as well. And a lot of times people think, oh, I just need to exfoliate more. I need to use more lotion, but actually it's oftentimes due to nutritional deficiencies. So essential fatty acid, zinc deficiencies, those can be, um, those, if somebody starts increasing their intake of that, improving their digestion, maybe doing some supplements that can also help. And then another one that people sometimes look at is these little cracks in the corners of their mouth. And that's called angular chelitis or chelosis. And that's oftentimes, and I've, I had this in, in med school and I was totally stressed out. I was, my, my, um, I was um, not eating quite as healthy because I was so busy studying and I started to get these. And I, as soon as I had um, a, I don't know, B vitamins, got those back in my diet and had some um, uh, IM shots, intra, intramuscular injections of some B vitamins, it went away. So I think a lot of times people just think, oh, it's just got dry skin or something along those lines, but also just dry skin in general can be a sign that you're not absorbing the good fats in your diet, or you're not getting enough of those essential fatty acids, vitamin A, things like that in your diet. Those can be signs too. Also, if you look around at people your age and you feel like you're aging faster than other people your age. That can mean that your collagen is breaking down. Your elastin collagen is breaking down more rapidly than it should. I mean, you know, aging is a natural process, right? But we don't want to look older than we are, right? And it's partly vanity, but it's also a sign of our health. And so if that's, you have accelerated signs of aging, you want to look at why is this happening? There might be some signs of um, oxidative damage. You might be have excess exposure to toxins in your environment. And so you might want to look at ways that you can can reduce those toxins, get some antioxidants in your, in both internally and externally to help with that. So the skin is the first area that I look at when I'm wondering, is there a deficiency of the good fats? It's the first place you look. And, you know, having adequate amounts of the good fats is critically important for brain function because the cell wall for every brain cell is made up of fats. And, you know, if you guys remember a lazy Susan, you know, in Chinese restaurants in the middle of the table and you put the food on there, it spins around so everybody can self-serve that in medical offices, they used to have lazy Susans in the wall between the bathroom and where the nurses were. Because you go in the bathroom and you give a urine sample into a cup and you put in the Lazy Susan and you spin it around to the other room, the nurse then takes it and does whatever she's supposed to do. The quality of your brain membranes, the wall, the outer wall, because brain cells talk to each other by making some chemicals and they go right through the Lazy Susans of the brain cell wall to the next brain cell. And then they do some chemicals with it. It kind of creates a little spark of electricity. And then it goes through the lazy Susan to the next brain cell. So the, the, when you eat bad fats, two things happen that I always tell people, many, many more than two happen, but two things happen. One, you, your lazy Susan start getting rusty. We call that brain fog, but your lazy Susans are getting rusty. And two, your skin starts to get dry that 
you know, your skin is an indicator of what's going on. Um, besides, what about um, uh, people uh, think, well, what about a crack in the toes or if, if in between your toes, you know, that gets really dry there. I mean, is that, you know, people say, no, my skin's great. Well, how, how are your toes? <laughs> I was like, what, what do you say? Uh, is your skin dry between your toes? What, what might that suggest? If you, if people who get the cracking between their toes, that's usually actually a fungal infection, right. like a fungal overgrowth. So, right. um, and it can in fact in, in, impact your nails as well and your toenails or teeth keep an eye on those too. Um, I know a lot of times people ignore their feet, but our feet is, are so important because we need them to walk around on. We need them to get around <laughs> right. with. Right. So right. take good care of your feet. Yeah. And yeah. And, the, and those, you're, you're absolutely right. I, I feel the same way. And those fungal infections are not in the toes. That's just where it's manifesting that it's in your gut. And that's why it's so important, as Dr. Cates is saying, you have to address the gut. You know, you have to bring balance to the microbiome of the gut to contribute to balancing the microbiome of the skin. Um, one of the questions that came up was, can Dr. Cates elaborate a little more on the HPA axis and the skin? Yeah, so it's really fascinating. And more information is coming out about the HPA axis. So I'm guessing your people know about the the brain's HPA axis, and 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 um, actually, it's related to our skin. So our skin can feel stress, and um, so when our skin, when we have trauma to the skin, when our skin feels stressed, it actually creates a chemical cascade of a stress response in the body. So we really do want to take good care of our skin, just like we. We take good care of our brains. And we're learning more of, of this connection between the brain and the skin and that, that there is an important crossover here. So I'm, um, you know, I think the, the most important thing to think about with this is that we want to take good care of our skin and also remember what you put on your skin doesn't just stay on the surface. So a lot of, that's another big myth that I, I think people don't necessarily say it, but they think it because people put all kinds of stuff on their skin, lotions and sunscreens and makeup and things without thinking, where is this going? Is this right. just going to stay on the surface? But yet we use hormone creams, nicotine patches, and use our skin as a route of delivery of medication. Delivery but so there's this disconnect there. So we need to start thinking when we put something on our skin, where's that going? <laughs> right. Right. Uh, Mary Jones is asking, is Premarin safe for someone with a uterus who has had HER2 positive breast cancer? So we're shifting full into our hormones here, which right. I love. This is the other big thing I'm passionate about. And I've got this nine part docu-series hormones, health and harmony coming out on May 10th. And I know you guys have the link for that, that you'll be sharing. We'll post and, the link here today. Yep. Yes. Thank you. And, um, so I'm, I'm big on hormones and I think, so partly what, what led me to kind of be more interested in that because of things like hormonal acne. And I kept getting patients that were saying, can you just get rid of my acne? I'm like, well, if we're going to get rid of your acne. We need to balance your hormones too. And so we need to address hormones. Hormones can be a big root cause behind skin issues. So I just wanted to close that gap, you know, make sure we understand why, why I'm talking about hormones too. And so, and as a naturopathic physician, I have been talking to women about their hormones for 20 to 22 years. I've been in practice. It's the biggest thing I get asked about. Right. So when it comes to, um, you know, Premarin, which is a type of hormone therapy, it, um, I would, what does, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. Well, what, what does the word Premarin where does it come from? Yes. Premarin comes, it comes from mare urine. So pregnant mare's urine, yes. Pre yes. Pre pregnant horse urine. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So it is not the same as our own hormones. 
Premarin that horses make very different type of estrogen than humans make. And I know, I think the medical establishment was trying to do a good thing by introducing this into a healthcare, but unfortunately it, it actually seems to create more problems than solutions. And the good news is there are much better alternatives. So bioidentical hormones are hormones that are molecularly the same as our own hormones. So when we get, when we get Premarin, <laughs> our body goes, what is that? It doesn't recognize it. So then it tries to take it apart or move it and do different things to it, to try and get to figure out what to do with it. But yet if it takes, if it, it gets exposed to a, a molecular structure, that's the same as ours, which are bioidentical hormones, then it knows what to do with it. And then it can help us. So definitely with Premarin, it, you want to be careful with that. I definitely would recommend if you can, you know, for anyone considering hormone replacement therapy, consider bioidenticals. Now, I think the question, I'm sorry, now I'm trying to remember the question has to uh, do uh, her with breast cancer. Breast cancer. Breast yes. cancer. So breast cancer is, is a tricky one with, with any kind of hormone replacement therapy. And I think it's really important to talk to your doctor about that. And one of the most important things that we talk about in the docu series, and I want to bring up here is that even bioidentical hormones, you want to be be careful with them because you want to establish a healthy foundation first. We don't want to just jump into hormone replacement therapy. We want to address the gut. We want to address nutritional deficiencies. We want to address tox, uh, you know, detoxification pathways and reducing toxins that we're exposed to, because when we're exposed to toxins in our environment, these endocrine disrupting chemicals can just really create a lot of issues in our bodies, including being connected to breast cancer. So we want to make sure that we're addressing these root causes. And of course, talk to your doctor about your options, because if you're getting, you know, you have breast cancer, you're getting treatment with that. You want to work with your doctor on this, but there are different options for you. So I would just definitely dig in a little bit and definitely watch the docu-series. <laughs> I de definitely watch the docu-series, Mary, uh, but I'm going to go a little deeper into this question. Um, I was just Googling. I asked Dr. Google, I went on okay. mute for a minute and asked Dr. Google, when was Premarin introduced to the market? 1941. So the technology in 1941 was such was that they found that these hormones seem to help people, it's, women mostly, uh, perimenopausal women with the symptoms that they were developing. Uh, uh, so in 1941, it was cutting edge technology. Let's move forward now 81 years to today and what the technology tells us. Premarin is meant for a horse, not for humans. And what's important about estrogens is how your body uses those estrogens. There's three different pathways that the body can use for these estrogens. And two, four, and 16, and I won't go into all the geeky stuff, but two is very protective for you. Four and 16 are not so good, right? <clears throat> so we want just a little bit of four and a little bit of 16, not too much, and a whole lot of two. So the ratio is really important. So Doctors like Dr. Cates do those tests to see how's your body handling estrogen and how much do you have right now? Premarin has a large percentage of the raw material. When you take that hormone, it goes down the four and 16. It alters your ratio. So the first three words in your question, Mary, are also where the answer is. Is Premarin safe? No. It was the best available 81 years ago, right? Um, that, and as Dr. Cates has said a number of times already, bioidentical hormones, bioidentical hormones. And what that means is hormones that are manufactured that are identical to human hormones. So your body can use them easier. That's why you want to find a doc that knows about this. And if you get her book, you'll know the questions to ask. And if you watch the series, you'll listen to experts talking about these kinds of things, right? 
And so it, it's a really good question. And I know it comes from a place of being really scared uh, because you've been diagnosed with breast cancer uh, uh, and you, you know, trying to find out what all your options are. You need more education and we can't do it for you because we don't know your history. We don't know what your microbiome is, which has a direct impact on how your body metabolizes estrogens. If you have an inflammatory microbiome, you don't handle the hormones very well, right? So uh, like Dr. Case, she keeps going back to the gut microbiome. And we didn't plan that ahead of time, but you've always he heard me talking about the gut, the gut, the gut. And it, with your question, Mary, that's also, I would get a microbiome test done of your gut uh, to make sure that you've got a balance. And you probably don't because you got cancer. So your microbiome is probably out of balance. And then you would want to be working along with the other things you do to build a healthier microbiome in your gut to protect you. And one of the benefits of moving over to bioidentical hormones and rebuilding a healthy microbiome is that you have nicer skin, right? So <laughs> that go, they, they go hand in hand. Right. They, they do. And, um, yeah. And, but there's, there's so much to help us with balancing our hormones. Um, and I, again, I, I want to reiterate that, you know, bioidentical hormones are, can be a great option for some people, but you've got to build that healthy foundation. And, you know, talking about the gut is a big part of that. And we dive in deep into this in the docuseries and even in the trailer that you'll see when you go to the, the site, the website for it, they, one of the experts, says it right from the beginning. Women are so shocked to hear, what does your gut have to do with your hormones? And most women have no idea that right. there's a connection. Right. And so people just think, oh, I have hormone problems. A lot of times women are put on birth control pills as a way to balance. And I'm using air quotes here in case anybody's not paying attention. This is not balancing your hormones. Birth control pills are made for birth control. They're not made for treating acne, regulating your, your cycles or with perimenopausal symptoms. They are not good for that. There are so many other options for us to help with balancing our hormones because uh, uh, birth control pills and believe me I've I'm, I have my history too I get a lot of uh, a lot of us women we've been put on hormonal birth control and cr it creates a number of issues it creates more gut microbiome issues it creates more hormonal imbalances it suppresses testosterone messes with your estrogen it creates nutritional deficiencies there are no and that comes with a number of side effects so let's save the birth control for birth control and look at other options for balancing our hormones right so when a woman is going through a change of life. And we, you know, that's called the perimenopausal period around menopause. It's like 10 years, five years before, five years after. It's about, about 10 years where there's transitions occurring. As the ovaries start to retire, they, they want to go to retirement home. They've been working really hard for many, many years, right? Every month you can count on them. There's ovulation and and you know, the egg comes out and maybe to be fertilized to continue the human race. Uh, when it's time to retire, as the ovaries start calming down, reducing their function, they're going into early retirement in the perimenopausal time. It's the job of your adrenal glands to take over and start making that estrogen. And the adrenal glands are supposed to make about one-tenth the estrogen that the woman made when she was ovulating to have children and, and all of that. Because you need a little bit of estrogen to keep your blood vessels happy, to keep your brain happy. You need a little bit. I'm sure they go into great detail on that, right? But the adrenal glands, these little glands the size of a walnut that sit on top of the kidneys, well, they're supposed to be the size of a walnut, but they get worn out and they shrivel down to the size of a peanut. Because of the stressful lives that people live, the adrenal glands, when they're called on, hey, adrenals, knock, knock, I need some estrogen here. And they go, oh yeah, get in line, get in line, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, you know, but that's what it is. And so you've got to rebuild the body so that the adrenals 
you start rebuilding adrenals along with the rest of your body, the microbiome, the healthier microbiome coordinates all of this. And it takes six months to a year of rebuilding, recovering from all of the wear and tear that the way we lived our lives. And we didn't know that the dial soap that had triclosan in it is a cancer causing agent in your soaps and the government outlaws triclosan. So what does a company do? It just sells it in Canada and in Mexico and the rest of the world causing more cancer causing cells. Right? And there are so many chemicals like that that are on your skin. Um, as a woman, I could not emphasize strong enough how important it is that if you're doing cosmetics, you know, if that's your thing and you want to, and most people do, you want to have the purest cosmetics that make your skin healthier. Not that you have to depend on, because if you don't put makeup on someday, your skin looks really bad, right? If that's the current state, okay, that's a reality check. Okay, I'm going to do Dr. Kate's um, uh, summit and I'm going to read her book so I can understand the mechanisms that I have to get involved with to rebuild a healthier skin. And how long does it take, Dr. Case? What, what do you tell your people when they've, they've got dry skin and maybe some wrinkles? And how long does it take before you would expect them to see results? Well, the skin cell turnover takes about 30 days, 28, 30 days. It, that time increases as we get older. It takes a little bit longer for the skin cells to turn over as we get older. But typically a lot of the results we start to see are in about a month. And sometimes you see things faster than that, but um, usually it's about a month that you start to see some changes and you know, you're going in the right direction. Now, you know, I'm, I get it. I'm, I'm 49 years old now. And I, I understand that when, as we get, I mean, I remember hitting 40 and thinking, you know, I might need to start using some different skincare products. Maybe this, maybe I need to start using other things. Cause I started to notice more of the fine lines and things. And again, this is a normal part of aging. Um, but there is a lot we can do both internally that we talked about with the gut and balancing our hormones, but also using clean and natural so that you're not getting these hormone disrupting chemicals in your skincare products, but using clean products. Yeah. Some of the best ingredients that you can use are plant-based oils. These plant-based oils have those really great fats and those oils that our skin needs. They just drink it up and they're full of antioxidants that our skin needs to protect against oxidative damage. And then if you're using the right kind of cleanser, that's balancing your skin, that's not making it too high of a pH, that's all going to help support your skin. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jane asks, can deep lines on face be reversed? Well, it depends. I mean, there are so many different factors that cause wrinkles and it de depends upon your age and, and what your, what your health is like. It's, I mean, some of the, the wrinkles that we have, we have to just sort of embrace them and love on them. I mean, of course there are things like Botox and fillers, but I'm sure that's not what you're asking me about because that's not the path that I personally take. And that's generally not the, what I recommend. Certainly if women choose to do those, that's their personal choice. But in, in looking at your skin naturally, there are things that you can do. Some of these plant-based oils can be really great to include. Also looking at the pH of your products. And here's a simple thing, because I keep talking about the pH and people oftentimes don't have any clue what the pH of their skincare products are. So you can actually test the pH of your skincare products with a simple pH strip. And so you can order them on Amazon, pick them up at the local drugstore, wherever, um, and just get uh, strips, pH strips. Now, so if here's, it's a, here's a, here's yeah. a strip of uh, uh, stamps on my friend's desk. He's got a strip of stamps here, right? So the pH strips are just like this, just tear off the pH strip, and uh, I, if you're doing saliva, you just lick it and you wait about 10, 15 seconds. And then on the strip itself, there's a plastic case and there's a little color code. And you just take a look at it and you see what's the pH right now. And yeah. is it the same for the skin that you just rub it on your skin? Well, I just usually will, you know, take the product and just put it 
and the product, just get that a little is. bit of the product. Now, if it's a hundred percent oil, if we're looking at it, like a face oil or something like that, and it's a hundred percent oil, you can't test the pH of, of oil. You could only test the pH of, you know, if there's water or, a, you know, non oil, um, liquid in there. So, but it's super simple. So, uh, moisturizers, um, foundations, you can check, um, anything that has more of a liquid substance to it cleansers, liquid cleansers, and just test the pH out. The thing is, is that most of them you'll find are over 5.5 and our skin does best with the 4.5 to even like ideally 4.5 to five for the face is what I prefer, but definitely not over 5.5. If you test your skincare products, then it's time to switch. If it's over 5.5, you also don't want it to be too acidic either. So a lot of times people say, Oh, I'm using vinegar on my skin, or I'm using lemon juice on my skin. I'm like, Whoa, that's really acidic. So you got to be careful with DIY, even just because something's natural also doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to be great for your, the pH of your skin in your skin microbiome. We want to be careful about DIY skincare products as well. JDS, is Dr. Case familiar with Montak Chia's massage and breath techniques for balancing hormones? I am not familiar with that technique, but I can tell you in the docu-series, we talk a lot about breath work, stress management, mindfulness practices, mindset in general. I think a lot of times women get in a rut of thinking, you know, especially we can really beat ourselves up. We can look in the mirror, especially as we're getting older and just really beat ourselves up or, or get, get down, especially if our hormones are out of balance, we start to really get critical of ourselves. So doing things to help our, our hormones, our adrenals. I mean, Dr. Tom, you talked about adrenals and how important these are. These are so important because that's our, that's our bank, our reserve bank for, for when we, um, get through menopause, right? We need our adrenals functioning. Plus we need them to get up, get going and have energy throughout the day. So we've got to take good care of our adrenal health. So doing mindset, breath work, stress management, all of that is crucial for our adrenal health. And that impacts not just our stress hormones, but our other hormones as well. Curtis asks, undoubtedly you cover this in your books, Dr. Cates, but for now, what are general recommendations for how to clean the skin and properly care for its microbiome? Yeah. So great question. I, 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 uh, two, two of the biggest mix, mistakes people make in their skincare routine are how they cleanse their skin and over exfoliating. Cause I think that was maybe about, I was looking through the questions a minute ago and, and if somebody had a question about how, you know, doing loofahs and just stuff like that. So those two things, people are either not doing enough of it or they're doing too much of it. So there is a balance on both of those. And of course it is good to have good hygiene and to, you know, I mean, that's just one of the great things about modern living is that we have running water, right? We can have good hygiene, but we've kind of gone overboard with it. Using bars of soap that are foamy, it's too high of a pH. It also strips the oils of your skin. So again, look at the pH of the, if, if you get a liquid soap that first of all, that's going to be better. And then you could test the pH of your liquid soap. Most likely you're going to find that it's over 5.5. And so, you know, at the spot doctor, and I'm, I know there are other natural lines out there that do have body products as well as face products the cleansers that actually have that right pH. So you're starting off your, your skincare routine, your hygiene routine in the right direction with the right cleanser, without stripping, without increasing the pH. And then, um, exfoliation can be a great thing. It does help with removing some of the, the dead skin cells that build up on our skin on, especially in like areas that this time of year, when we're going from winter into spring and still feels like winter here in park city, we still have snow on the mountains, <laughs> so, but you know, you're doing some exfoliation to, to help our skin cell turnover can be a great thing. But you do want to be careful because remember, 
your skin is your largest organ and it has these functions of it, of the microbiome and these microorganisms that live on it. So if you're just scrubbing the heck out of your body, you're going to be damaging that. You could also, if you're doing it on your face, you could be damaging the collagen in your skin as well. And that nice, that firmness that we, that we want to maintain in our skin. So doing exfoliation is great. And I do love dry skin brushing. That's a great detoxification technique, but do it on your body, not your face. Like when it comes to your neck and your face, you want to be more gentle with that. So, um, I actually, I have one right here. Um, we have these, um, sponges that we, as we saw at the spot doctor, I love these are conjac sponge. It's K O N J A C. These are actually natural biodegradable and you can get them wet and they just provide enough exfoliation that kind of removes makeup and debris for women that are wearing makeup and it also provides some nice exfoliation without damaging your skin. And then it starts, it's biodegradable. So you throw it in your compost pile. Like how, how great is that? <laughs> so I, I am no skin expert by any means, but I've said this for years and, um, I will, um, uh, uh uh, withdraw any parts of this that are in conflict with an expert like Dr. Cates. But what I've recommended for years is get an organic shampoo and you put on your head and then you take some of the soap and you use it in the areas where bacteria can grow, you know, in, in the groin area, under the arms and in the rest of the body, I recommend a Japanese cloth and they're on Amazon, just type in Japanese washcloth. And they come in three different colors, blue, pink, and I don't remember what the other color is. Um, uh, they're, they're like sandpaper in terms of grades of roughness, like sandpaper is grades of roughness. And you take the lightest one of the three, I think it's the yellow is the lightest, and you just do your back, you know, and you do it back like this, and you know, and under your butt, and then down your legs, and you're brushing off the dead skin cells. And you don't want to be abrasive with it. And some people have tender skin and it feels like sandpaper. Well, that's too much. You need like a loofah sponge instead. But the idea is not to use soaps. Uh, you're not in the mud, you know, and uh, people are live, live for the most part, most of us live pretty sterile lives every day. And we, we don't need to lather up our whole bodies and change the pH, you know, you know, all that soap, but for your hair, you're under the arms and the groin where bacteria can grow. It's important to do that. Uh, so that's just a general recommendation I've given for years. Dr. Cates, anything that uh, causes alarm for you when I say that? And please be honest. It's okay. No, you know what? I think what I want to do is send you some of my body products so that you can use my body uh, wash instead. Uh, okay. <laughs> so that would be one thing I would suggest. Instead of the shampoo? Okay. Yeah, instead of the shampoo. Um, I bet if you were to test that pH of that shampoo, I bet it's five. It's pH is over 5.5. So yeah. checking it back to me, because, you know, if you found a nice um, shampoo that can be used on the entire body, but our, our body wash can be used on the face, the whole body. Um, right. I've never tried it in the hair cause I've got more hair than you do. <laughs> Maybe it would, when I'm not sure how that would work, right. but it doesn't right. foam the same way. It doesn't foam up like big suds. So, which is actually a good sign when, when something is really foamy, it probably has a high pH. So just something to be aware of. And then remember that not all bacteria is bad that, right. um, we just, we need the right balance of bacteria. Right. Another at a chest, because you talked about bacteria and, and the armpits, I wanted to bring this up because people use, a lot of people use antiperspirants yeah. and antiperspirants. There's actually been research that shown that antiperspirants create more of the malodorous bacteria wow. under our arms. Yeah. So antiperspirant will make you smell worse. <laughs> Yeah. So please don't use antiperspirant. If you're going to use something, um, then use like a natural deodorant. That's not going to keep you from perspiring and messing up the, 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 um, skin microbiota. And is there something on, um, uh, in your line of products, that's a natural deodorant. We don't have one right now. I mean, I think that, um, there's, there are lots of ones out there actually have DIY skincare recipes on how to make your own deodorant. So there are other alternatives. We don't have by one. Way, D, by the way, DIY means do it yourself. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and, and is, are, are there recipes in your book to make your own deodorant? 
Yeah. I actually have one in my next book. I do oh. have a recipe because I talk oh. about the importance of this. And, and actually, if you do notice that you really need a deodorant, it actually might mean that you've got some toxin exposures and you might need to change your diet and your yes. work on your gut health because work, work on your microbiome, right? Yeah. It, because if you've got a lot of bad smells coming from you, that's not a good sign. In fact, I know, um, you know, there are plenty of people that go without using any deodorants because they're, they find that they just don't have that bad odor anymore. Once well, they get um, their health. Yeah, I don't, I don't. And oh. uh, that's probably why most people are happy that I live in the jungle. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, let's see. Uh, Andrea has the question, can hormone imbalance cause cell cellulite? So cellulite isn't as much from, um, hormonal imbalances. It more has to do with it, part of it's genetic, but it has to do with the way that your, your skin and what's under your skin, um, lays together. And it does change as we age our collagen changes the, the, um, so we might see more cellulite as we get older. But, um, I would say though, overall, if you get into a healthy balance, then you might see a diminishment in your cellulite. And I actually, there are also things like making sure that your collagen is supported, even, you know, taking maybe a collagen peptide supplement may help with that. Curtis asks, please discuss how the skin and immune function interrelate. For example, why does psoriasis or eczema happen in relationship to immune function? Yeah, that's a really great question. And there are a, a bunch of different skin issues that are related to the immune system. And I often, in my book, Clean Skin from Them, my first book, I, I have different skin types that I talk about and the Emmet skin type. So if people want to find out what skin type they are, they can go to theskinquiz.com, theskinquiz.com. I talk about different skin personality types and Emmet is, is one of them, which is commonly with people with things like eczema, atopic dermatitis, psoriasis, or other immune related skin issues. So people can have, um, autoimmune diseases of, you know, various, you can have a thyroid immune, autoimmune disease. You could also have an autoimmune disease of the skin. So these are two common ones, psoriasis and atopic dermatitis, where the immune system is actually out of balance, it's attacking itself and unfortunately can worsen these skin problems. The good news is that there are things that we can do to support our immune system, balance our immune system. A lot of it goes back to the gut 